Good morning and welcome and happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Aww, Day. thank you. Um, would you just take a moment to wish each other happy Father's Day um, on the comments below and then get ready to join us for some worship. Good morning, Lighthouse. I got my coffee. And I got my chicken. Good morning, Lighthouse. Good morning, church family. <laughs> Cheers. Hello, church. Good morning, church. Good morning, church family. Good morning, church. Good morning, Lighthouse. Hi. Ready, Ready for worship. worship. Hello, church family. Hi, Lighthouse. Welcome to church. I hope you have a great morning. It's a beautiful day. Let's hear God's word. Good morning, church family. Be on my list. Ever be on my list. Ever be on my list. 
have you ever been stuck? Have you ever been stuck? I feel like there's a reoccurring theme in this sermon series right now. Just being stuck. I, I was reflecting on times in my life where I had gotten stuck, and one of them, I found myself driving a car, um, 16 years old, I believe, and I was with some friends, and we just happened to find ourselves in a muddy field. Um, our car was going in circles, uh, not of my own accord. No, I'm just kidding. That's, that's a lie. I was definitely going in circles and spinning out and doing donuts and all that kind of stuff. Um, I shouldn't have. I understand that now, being more mature and older. But I remember at one point, maybe it was just God. I, I'm going to say this was probably God. We, we stopped. We were laughing. We were giggling. And, and we were laughing so hard we were crying. And we were talking about it. And then at one point, everyone's like, okay, let's go get uh, Taco Bell. That was our thing what we got back then. And so I'm like, yeah. And I push on the gas. And we don't go anywhere. And you hear, you know, the engine revving up and the tires moving. But no, we're not going anywhere. And so then we I rev it again. And I push more on the gas, and then more on the gas, and then and then we're doing this thing in the car to try to get forward, and it just kept getting worse. And at some point, someone hopped out and just covered in mud, and then trying to push it. It eventually we got it. Uh, but w- one thing that I do notice is, practically speaking, and then also illustratively speaking, whenever we get stuck, we have two options, right? We can panic. We can panic so hard we get more stuck. Or we can be calm, cool, collective, and make wise decisions to get unstuck. I was not so much on the wise decisions back then. We eventually got out covered in mud all over the car, all over us. But have you ever felt that? Like you feel stuck. And have you ever felt that moment where it's like that first moment of, (gasps) and we take these short breaths and like, (gasps) you know, what do I do? I better do something right now. I need to make a snap decision. I can't think it through. I just, and that's what adrenaline does in our lives, in our bodies. It just makes us move forward. And sometimes when we get emotionally or mentally stuck, we do the same thing. We can make dumb decisions when we feel stuck in life. And someone I, I want, I really want to look at today is Paul. Paul has several books in the Bible and what, four or five times? Four books, five books, he, he gets stuck in prison. <laughs> Just gets thrown, locked up, in chains, and he's stuck. And the brilliance of Paul is he has this way about him where he doesn't panic. I, I want to look at a couple different times where he gets stuck today. And we're going to be in Philemon today. If you can't find it, it is a very tiny book, one chapter long. It's towards the end of the Bible. And I also want to look at one instance in Acts where, where Paul gets stuck. And it's, it's really brilliant what he does in these moments and what God speaks to him about. So without further ado, let's jump into Acts chapter 9. This is the moment where Paul is actually Saul. Paul's name changes at some point down the road. And he starts off his journey going to persecute and murder Christians. And God completely shuts off his eyesight. He makes him blind for a few days. And this is the story, Acts chapter 9, verse 8 through 9. It says, Saul, who will be Paul, got up from the ground. But when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind. And did not eat or drink anything. This is, this is a humbling moment. right? Paul's on his own, moving forward to go persecute Christians. And then the ones that find him blind are Christians. The ones he went to go murder are the ones that are now helping him. Mm-hmm. Holding him by the hand like a baby. right? Like a little kid crossing the street. I, I can only imagine what's going on in Paul's mind. You know, he could be scared. He could be terrified. But one thing I do know is he was at the top of his game, Hmm. right? He describes himself as as the best Pharisee, as the best arguer, as the best of the best, whatever, right? In the men in black scene where he's like, the best of the best of the best, sir. And that's Paul. And he is humbled. 
has to be walked along hand in hand with a Christian led into the town and he doesn't even eat or drink for three days. That's humbling. So one thing I want to I want to talk about is I, I want to break down simplistically two types of ways that we can be stuck. Right? There's the internal stuckness and the external stuckness. The moment where we're just internally, emotionally, or mentally, or whatever, we just feel stuck. And it's something to do with where we're at in life. Maybe it's, I feel like I should be farther along, or I feel like this, or this is happening. And, and it's this internal moment. And then you have the external kind, where I'll, I'll talk about in a second. And the thing that I really want to bring out is internally. When we're internally stuck. It's most often because God is trying to speak to us and teach us. He is bringing us humility so that we understand our relationship with Jesus and our relationship with people. That's usually what's going on. It's, it's this refining moment. It's the university of Jesus, if you will. When, when things aren't going right and our mind is just thrown for whatever reason and God's saying I hope he gets it I hope she gets it I'm trying to teach them humility so that they stop thinking about themselves and they start thinking about me and my people internally when we're stuck oftentimes it's because God is trying to speak to us and teach us and then I, I want to spend most of the rest of today in, in Philemon Let's jump down to verse 1. Philemon, verse 1. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and fellow worker, also to Aphia, our sister, and our Ficus, our fellow soldier, and to the church that meets in your home, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. See, there, there's something else happening right here. Paul is sitting in prison, and he's writing a letter to, to his dear friends. He has, has become stuck in the world. Right before, it was God halting his movement. He was preventing him moving forward with murdering more Christians. And right now, the world has halted him from moving forward. Right? There's, there's a difference, because the first one is all about God speaking to him, but this one is external. It's the world halting him, stopping him. And I want to say most of the times when we're externally halted or externally stopped, it's because it's the enemy or, or the devil, if you will, trying to swap out your humility with pride, with resentment, with bitterness, with, with envy, with all these different things. Because if he can stop your movement forward, if you lose momentum in your relationship with God, you become stuck. So when your humility is gone, and you're, oh, look at me, I'm doing great. Oh, that person, that person, you know, and, and it halts your movement. Because if he can exchange your humility with some envy, with some pride, with some bitterness, with whatever he's going to exchange it with, he can stop your relationship with Jesus moving forward, and he can stop your focus on the kingdom of God and building relationships with people. So there, there's two types of being stuck. And it would, it would really benefit you, it benefits me to understand what season am I in? Is God speaking to me, or is the enemy trying to detour me from what God has called me to do? We need to discern which season we're in. So, what I love about all this, when Paul was stuck by God, and he was internally dealing with stuff, he took it as an opportunity to still allow himself to be in contact with other people, spend time with, with his relationship with God. And, and then when he was externally stuck, he didn't throw himself a pity party, right? He was in jail and he didn't throw himself a pity party. He was just there. 
and he still had an impact. He still dug deeper in his relationship with God. He still dug deeper in his relationship with people. And I, I really think that when we, when we feel a loss of momentum, when we feel like we're not moving forward, we halt the progress on everything in our lives. Just because your work stops your movement forward doesn't mean every area of your life has stopped moving. Right? We, we can't say everything is halted just because one area has stopped. We need to keep digging deep. We need to keep, keep pressing forward, just like Paul did. He was in chains, and he still loved people. He was still writing letters. Just because you're stuck doesn't mean you can't make an impact. Doesn't mean you can press forward. So I know we throw out the term doing life together a lot. I mean, I, I feel like we've thrown it out every single week for the last month or two. Uh, we said a lot of times, doing life together, doing life together. And I, I kind of want to define that a little bit more because that's, if we don't have a definition, we can just check that box saying, yeah, I'm doing life together. You know, and we can just throw out any arbitrary definition of what we want that to be. But today, I, I want to define it for us, especially through the, the lens of Paul. Doing life together is mutual impact. Mutual impact. Write that down, circle it, put it in a comment down below. Mutual impact. Meaning this. When, when we're doing life together, we're mutually impacting each other. If you say something, I'm able to receive that. I'm able to grow from it. If you have a word of wisdom, a word of encouragement, I receive it. Likewise, you receive it if I have a word of it. And, and we have this, this cohesive relationship that says give and take, right? Mutual impact. It's Don't be that person that when someone else is talking, you are ignoring them and you're just waiting for them to, to take a breath so that you can just start rattling off. Don't be that person. And don't be that person that would have the audacity dacity, to think that God can't speak through another human being to you to give you a word. Yes. Right? If, if the Bible has a story where God used a donkey to speak to someone, they can use someone else that's next to you. Right? God is speaking. And it's this, this mutual impact and I love breaking it down because not only does Paul have this mutual impact with, with people around him, it's, it's short distance, it's long distance, it's next to him, it's, it's far away. He understands this. He, he gets it. He's able to do life together. He's not this dictator or religious leader who's untouchable, who's just like, no, no, no. Thus saith the Lord, he spoke to me, I'm telling you what to do, now do it. No, he, he starts off his letters by saying, grace, peace, I, I love you. And he, said, and he says, I heard this and it's, it's giving me peace, giving me joy, giving me encouragement. Right? It's this mutual give and take. And that's what is the heart of doing life together. It's this mutual impact that's going on. So I want to say this again. Your impact is not determined by your situation. Right? When everything is good in your life, it's really easy to impact other people. But when things are not going good, it becomes significantly harder. And Paul is the poster boy of when things are good and when things are bad, he has the exact same impact. Yeah. So can we. If Paul can do it, we can too. And the other, the other thing that's crazy is he didn't have technology. Right? Paul is sitting there with a quill and papyrus piece of paper, whatever they're, all, whatever they're writing on. And he's entrusting and hoping that someone will get out of this prison and deliver this letter across the country to someone else. You know, however many towns down the road. Hopefully they don't get mugged. Right? It blows my mind. And in one second, we can mutually impact someone else on this planet. And the 
crazy thing is, we don't. We can miss out because we can think that our situation dictates our impact. And Paul impacted hundreds, if not thousands of people who were living at that time and now has impacted millions after he's died. We, we read his letters that are, what, two-thirds of the New Testament? It blows my mind. Even when he was in prison, in jail, he's impacting my life thousands of years later because he didn't allow the enemy to make him feel insignificant and worthless. Yeah. I think that's a word for someone today. That just that yeah. just popped up through the Holy Spirit. If you feel insignificant and worthless right now, do not buy into that lie. That is a lie, full on, from the enemy. You are meaningful, yes. and you are worth it. Yes. Jesus died on the cross. You need to understand that. You need to grasp it. Start running forward. You might feel stuck because the enemy wants you to feel stuck. But it's your time to run. And you do that by starting to do life together. That's what Paul did when he was stuck. Love it. The title today, that was the longest introduction to a sermon ever. We're like halfway. <laughs> Today's message is hope is now. I, I think one of the things that we can also miss out is when we feel stuck by the enemy and we feel like we're not moving forward we can fixate our minds on, my hope is when I get out. My hope is this finish line of getting out of my stuckness. Right? My hope is there. And God's like, whoa, wait, wait a minute. Your hope isn't a finish line. The Bible clearly defines that hope is a name and that hope is Jesus. Mm -hmm. We're the anchor of my soul. The anchor's description is what Jesus is. He holds us into the inner sanctum. Jesus is hope. Jesus is our hope. And we can't for one moment think that my hope is the destination after getting out of being stuck. No, your hope is now. Jesus is with you right now. He's not waiting for you to get out of whatever you're in. He's like, I'm here. Let's go. Can you grow? You can do something. And, and, and it starts right now. Hope is now. Hope is with you in your situation. So what are you and Jesus doing while you're stuck? If hope is now and hope is here and hope is Jesus, and he's next to you, what are you and Jesus doing? Think about it. What, what are you doing? right now with Jesus. I want, I want to break it in through the lens of doing life together or mutual impact. And I want to jump back into Philemon verse 4 through 7. Again, this is all chapter 1 because there only is one chapter. Every time your name comes up in my prayers, this is the letter of Paul writing out. Every time your name comes up in my prayers, I say, oh, thank you, God. I keep hearing of the love and faith you have for the Master Jesus, which brims over to other believers. And I keep praying that this faith we hold in common keeps showing up in the good things we do, and that people recognize Christ in all of it. Friend, you have no idea how good your love makes me feel, doubly so when I see your hospitality to fellow believers. Mutual impact. It's this, this whole section of verses. It's, it's the action items of what mutually impact means. Doing life together actually is what it's doing, what it's happening. A big thing that it talks about is praying for each other. It says, in my prayers, I thank God for you. One of the things that we need to do for mutually impacting, for doing life together is pray for each other. That's like step one, right? When I go into my prayer room, my, my closet, my time before Jesus, the throne, I pray for you. P 
please pray for me. <laughs> please. Likewise, who, who are you mutually impacting? Who are you doing life together? Are you praying for them? And likewise, are they praying for you? Because we need to kick that over. We need to get that started. Another, another takeaway in here is, is he's thankful. Be thankful for that person in your life. Sometimes the closer you get to someone, the more you can get frustrated at moments with them. Right? Those times where, like things flare up and you're like, come on, like we need to do stuff. Like, well, you know? And it's those moments you just need to be thankful. I, I'm so much better off with doing life together with you than I ever was alone. I'm thankful for you in my life. That's a, that's a huge takeaway because when we're thankful, we're prayerful. Mm -hmm. I love this. Another takeaway was he feels joy and happiness whenever he hears about the other person. Don't allow the enemy to make you feel jealous for people around you when they're like, oh, I got a promotion. And you're like, well, I wish I had a promotion. I got a new car. Well, I wish I had a new car. I got a new cat. Well, that's good for you. No, I'm just kidding. I wish I had a cat. Me and Ollie are like, we want the cats. And Patty and London want the dogs. And it's, yes. there's like, I don't know. Pray for us, y'all. <laughs> uh, can, can you feel joy, feel happiness, feel excitement when someone you're doing life together has a win? That's a huge thing. And then likewise, are they excited for you when you get a win? That's, a, that's another part of doing life together. That's another part of this mutual impact is we're excited when we're excited and we're going after it. Another is genuine love for each other, right? There's like a few different types of love out there. It's like, oh man, I love you. <laughs> okay, see you later, right? I love you for a short time. There's all kinds of loves. I love you for a long time. I love you from a distance, right? No, that's not the types of love we're talking about here. We're talking about that, man, I love you so much. I would do anything for you. Man, you don't even need a call. I know when you're hurting. And I'm just going to drop off some soup. I'm going to drop off cookie. Whatever you need, I'm going to drop it off. I'm going to be there when you are hurting, and I'm going to hurt too. It's this genuine love that comes out when we do life together, when we have this mutual impact going back and forth. And then, this is huge. The big takeaway is Paul is writing a letter, and he is receiving information back of what's happening. There is a communication going on. To be mutually impactful, to doing life together, there needs to be communication, sent and received. It's not a one-way street in doing life together. It's a two-way street. And then I think the, the thing that's like missed out a lot on communication is the art of communication. Are you communicating to where that person understands your heart? And are you listening to understand their heart? It's just this communication that needs to take place. Right? You know, one of my one of my best friends, we communicate through memes and gifts. And, and yes, it is gifts, not gifs. Okay, just, just so we are on the same page there. Um, that's how we communicate. And when we're hurting, those gifts, those memes, they show the hurt. And it's like, man, you know what? I'm I'm praying for you. I'm so sorry you're going through that. Let me encourage you. Let me build you up. Let me talk about what Jesus is speaking right now. Let me, let me listen to the Holy Spirit and see if I have a word for you right now. It's, it's these kind of ways that we can communicate. Just because you understand and you receive a communication one way doesn't mean that person hears and receives it the same way you do. And the art of of mutual impact is understanding how to deliver the message for that person to receive it. Mm -hmm. And Paul was brilliant at it. He understood how to write a letter for that person to receive it. 
Because this letter, Philemon, I'm not going to jump into all of it. We don't have the time of the day to go into it. But he sends a letter to build and courage and also say, listen, you messed up. Now you need to fix it. But I love you. <laughs> and I can't wait to hang out with you. Right? That's, 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 that's the beauty of communication. We need to understand that we need to, to have them receive what we need to share. And we need to hear what they need to share with us. I love this. Romans chapter 12, verse 15, just breaks it down simply of, of doing life together, of communication. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. It's brilliant. Just so simple. So basic. If someone's hurting, you're with them. If someone's doing awesome, you're with them. Through thick and through thin, you're with them. And likewise, when you're hurting and when you're doing good, they're with you. So, jumping down, we understand doing life together. We understand the internal, the external, being stuck. What I want to look at is, who is he doing life together with? This is, a, this is another big takeaway. Who is he impacting? Who, who, what's, what's the significance? Who are the people involved here? What's, what's going on in this letter? And we have three groups of people, three, three items, three, three locations where it references people. And there's multiple people in each area of who he's impacting, who he's mutually impacting, who he's doing life together with. And first one, he is mutually impacting people that are in the same situation, right? Not only does it say Paul's in prison, but he lists off people that he's in prison with. He lists off people that are next to him in the room. He's like, from so-and-so and so-and-so. And also, so-and-so gives my, their regards too. Right? We need to have mutual impact with people in our same boat. People that are in the same situation. Right? This could, this could you know, we have, could have a laundry list of what the same boat looks like. But practically speaking... Maybe look to your left, look to your right. Someone you're living with. Someone, maybe it's your spouse, significant other, best friend. It's someone who you are just in it all the time. You are in the same boat with that person. Maybe it's a colleague at work. Maybe, you know, who knows? Maybe you went to college together. You're just in the same boat. It's those people that are, we, we need to have this mutual interaction with, this doing life together with. We're in it because of this situation, and we're going to make it through, and, and we're going to do awesome things. And the second group of people, the second type of person, is it's these long-distance people. He's writing a letter to send over to Philemon, and it's doing life together with someone who's far away, someone who's not really in the same boat but your lives intersected at one point and you may have grown, grown distance locationally or mentally or whatever. But it's someone who you connected with at one point in your life who you both are still moving forward in, in different locations, if you will. But he stays connected. I think it's, it's always sad when you grow really close to someone at one moment but then just for life or whatever reason, you grow apart and you just fall off the face of the earth in a way. You know, you'll see them on Facebook and you like it and you comment, but that's not really mutually impacting. That's not doing life together. That's kind of witnessing life <laughs> happen. But doing life together, it's saying we had this intersection and now we're knit. And as we keep growing... Let's pray for one another. Let's encourage one another. Let's, let's have some FaceTime. Let's do some Skype. Whatever it is. And let's stay together. And then the, the third person, the third breakaway, is the, the main theme of Philemon. Let me just take a break right here. The, the main entire point of Philemon is someone messed up and Paul is correcting that person. Right? It's about redemption and forgiveness 
and moving forward in the kingdom of God. That's the main theme. But the minor theme is reconciliation and doing life together. And so the, the third person that, that Paul is impacting, which is really interesting, is this. People going through what you already have been through. People going through what you've already been through. I want you to just think about times in your life that, oh, I went through that. That was a test. That was a trial. That was rough. <laughs> Those moments. I made it through the other side. Because God will keep sending you those people that are in the middle of the storm that you already made it through. It's these people that we need to do life together with. To say, I made it through and I'm going to walk with you right now because I love you and I'm excited and I believe in you. And God has a calling and a purpose and a plan on your life. And you cannot let this situation tear you down. Mm. And it's these people. And so he meets Onesimus. Right? This guy gets radically saved. He ran away. He was a thief. He stole. Did all these things. He has a history of sin. And Paul ministers to him. Turns his life around by showing him Jesus says, I love you so much, but you need to reconcile and go back to where you came from and bring forgiveness. Just like how Jesus forgave me, Jesus forgave you. Now your journey needs to move forward. But we're going to stay in contact because I believe in you. And we need to have the same kind of heart, the same kind of understanding, the same desire and draw. And these are the three types of people that Paul has Mutual impact with doing life together in this one book. It's the three type of people that simplicity, breaking it out, we need to have doing life together with. Right? So what, what my challenge is for you today, your, your next step, if you will, your next step to doing life together is pick a person to do life together that's outside your home. I want to challenge you. I want you to be like Paul for a moment. I don't want you to pick the person that's sitting next to you. I don't want you to pick someone in your household right now. I want you to pick someone who's outside your house, just like Paul picked. And make it a point to start doing life together. And I want to, I want to throw like an old school challenge, okay? Paul wrote a letter because he was doing life with someone. I want to challenge you. Would you write a letter because you want to do life with someone? Old school. You need to get a stamp. You need to get a letter. <laughs> YouTube, how to write out an address on there. I, whatever you need to do to figure out how to write a letter. I want you to, to challenge you to do it today as your next step. How, how can you initiate doing life together? Maybe you need to research how Paul writes a letter. These are all letters. Starts off by encouraging. Goes into saying how much that person blesses them. Talks about stories. Talks about what God's speaking about. And wraps it up by saying, my grace and peace go with you and, and I love you and you encourage me. You know, formulate it just like a, a Paul's letter. And I already know someone. someone's on your mind right now. Someone is right on the tip of you. And what's funny is I, I felt it. I know it. Someone was on your mind, and you're like, oh, wait, no, that's too hard. Let me think of someone else. No, you did not. No take backs. <laughs> the Holy Spirit just spoke to you, and you know the person who you're supposed to be doing this with, and you need to mail them that letter. And maybe it needs to be a tough letter because you need to apologize, and you don't want to apologize. I don't know what it is. I just felt prompted in my spirit to say that. Someone is on your heart, mail in the letter. And don't let it stop there. Continue in your conversation through social media, through texting, through calling, through video, whatever it might be. Paul did not have this technology, and he was able to do life together with people who were 
far away. So that's not an excuse. All right, just because you're stuck in your home is not an excuse to hang up your relationships. <laughs> Let's pray. Lord, continue speaking to us. I pray for a strength, a boldness, a readiness to bring impact into doing life together. There is something that you're stirring up in all of us right now. I pray that we would not shy away from that. I pray that we would not be hindered by anything, but we would move forward in our relationships as the enemy is trying to tear down our relationship with you and with people and, and put bitterness and envy and all that in our lives. I pray a block on that, a hedge of protection on that, that we would be encouraged that in this moment, right now, if wherever we feel stuck, that we would reach out and start building up these relationships, that we would start doing life together. In your mighty name, amen. Amen. Open.
mountain I will climb this mountain with my hands wide open I will climb this mountain with my hands wide open I will climb this mountain with my hands wide open I will climb this mountain with my hands wide open I will climb this mountain with my hands wide open I will climb this mountain with my hands wide open I will climb this mountain with my hands there's nothing I hold on Nothing I hold on to. Nothing I hold on to. Nothing I hold on to. When I'm holding on to you. Oh, there's nothing I hold on to. There's nothing I hold on to. There's nothing I hold on to. When I'm holding on to you. I will climb this mountain with my hands open. I will climb this mountain with my hands wide open. You pour out blessings. You pour out blessings. no, there's no gift too good for you. Not on my own understanding. My life is in the hands of the maker of heaven. I lean not on my own understanding. My life is in the hands of the maker of heaven. Why give it all to you, God? Trusting that you'll make something beautiful out of me. I give it all to you, God. Trusting that you'll make something beautiful out of me. I give it all to you. Trusting that you'll make something beautiful out of me oh I give it all to you God trusting that you'll make something beautiful out of me we trust you Wide open, I will climb this mountain with my hands. Wide open, I will climb this Always such a sweet time in worship with the Lord, right? Um, as we prepare for our tithe and offering, just know that you can click on the link above and go to the giving page and give there. You can also designate funds for children's the children's fund for children's ministry. Um, we're still fundraising for that. Speaking of children, please check out the kids camp uh, yeah. registration. It's getting closer and we're so excited for it. I, I think I'm looking forward to it more than the kids are. <laughs> um, but get your kids signed up. It's lots of lots of good stuff and it keeps them entertained and busy and learning about the Lord. It's, it's like a win-win for everybody. <laughs> so sign your kids up. 
Um, and then if you have been, uh, been receiving our weekly newsletters, make sure you send us an email at info at lighthouse805.com. Um, and so we can add you onto our newsletter list and you can be receiving all those updates um, once a week. And so it's just another way that we keep in touch with you. And, and actually, I was going to interrupt. I'm sorry. So if you've signed up for the newsletter and you don't see the newsletter, we send it every week and it could be in your promotions or your spam. Just go ahead and add us to your inbox so you can keep up to date. Uh, just want to throw that out there. So no. gets one pass for uh, interruption because okay. it's Father's Day. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then also our social media. Follow us at uh, on Instagram at Lighthouse805 and on Facebook. At, um, you can find our page, Lighthouse805 Church. And today's Father's Day, but we had the last like three days we've had Father's Day posts. And so go back and check those out. They're really fun. And just share your stories in the comment section and read other people's. They're, they're really fun and funny. Yeah. And we start to realize what unique personalities our dads have, our father figures have. Um, and it's just fun to, to get a glimpse into other, into other dads and how funny and silly they all actually are. <laughs> so with that, enjoy your Father's Day. Have fun grilling and eating, playing games, or just vegging out on the couch watching TV. It's totally okay. <laughs> and make sure you leave a dad's joke or father's joke yes. on the comment below because I am a sucker for dad jokes. We so. make fun of dads, but everybody loves them. <laughs> So, you guys have a great Father's Day. Enjoy, and we'll see you next week. <laughs> Bye. Bye.